Hello YouTube and Mystery Report subscribers, this is Terrell from Terrell03.com and today is May 26, 2020 and this is the first Mystery Report in some time, greatly abbreviated. This is uh, the uh, my apologies, my time is extremely limited, heavy, heavy workload and uh, the newsletter, this newsletter program from here out, it looks like Based, way, based upon the way things look, is that a newsletter subscriber is going to have access to the newsletters in the Dropbox folder, and those in the Tutor program are the ones that are able to, well, do what Linda did. Send me your questions, and you get a detailed answer uh, to your questions. This week in newsletter program is about helping people see God's wisdom hidden in plain sight using his three witnesses of spirit, blood, and water. Spirit, water, and blood testifying in the Holy Scriptures from Genesis 1 1 through Revelation. Then appreciate John sending the, this is from the 2012 series. When you're a subscriber, you have access to these links and a lot, a ton of information. These are from some recent chat, some chats back in January and February, whenever we could do it. Now I'm on a uh, metered out here in the middle of the Ozarks using a hotspot. So many G's. And uh, for all doing all my research and for making reports to you guys, that's another one of the limitations that I'm having out here. So uh, I want to get the uh, get the Linda's questions. So this seems to be what uh, subscribers really want is my commentary to, uh, to their questions and helping them to see the three witnesses in the scriptures. Once you see it, it changes everything. So I would like to ask some questions that may help others. Are the people at Jesus' table aspects of human personality? That's not a question. That's not a question that I have received before. This lady is a little more advanced. And uh, I met her personally. And she sees God's hidden wisdom probably better than anybody that I've met before. She she had my, a copy of my book. You could tell she had read just looking how, mu how many of the pages were bent. You can tell she's been in it and backwards and forwards in it. So, um, God's th this is my answer to the first question. God's word is multidimensional, living and active document built upon the framework mirroring the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the heaven, seven, and the earth, teaching lessons to his children where faith is the seed, knowledge is the shoot, and wisdom is the fruit containing the next generation of seeds. The important thing to realize is that all we have is seeds. That's all I have. You have a good heart. The seeds get sown. We water. God causes the growth. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. God reveals himself and his wisdom to his children as if we are all standing around a magnificent jewel looking into many facets requiring us to share together for seeing the entire picture. Therefore, um, God may reveal to some that each of Christ's disciples represent aspects of human personality, but he has not made those revelations known to me. The common denominator, in other words, just because I haven't seen it yet, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. God's shown me many, many, many things that other people can't see. Chances are he's showing things to you guys that he hasn't let me see either. We have to share. Uh, that movie, The Arrival, where the aliens come from outer space, and they give 12 different parts so everybody has to work together. It's kind of like that. The common denominator shared by all disciples is they have no faith. Where Peter is the first. The, 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 the host on this planet to have the least faith of anybody to ever walk the planet. And they'll ever walk the planet is Peter. I know how that sounds. But whenever he's called the first, he's the last. Matthew 10 too. And backwards right on down the, down the order. That's how God handicapped Christ when he came here, incarnate as the living word, made flesh. He was surrounded by people who had no faith at all. He told them over and over and over again that he was going to be raised on the third day. Three times just in the account of Matthew. And where were they? They were mourning. Just the women showed up. And the women showed up with what? Linen, spices to anoint the body. If they had faith, they wouldn't have come with any of those things. They'd have been... Ready to welcome him when he came out of the tomb, right? That's the lesson. The lesson about uh, 
how if they had the faith of a mustard seed, they could move mountains. It wasn't that they're going to move mountains or anybody's ever going to move mountains. It was that they had zero faith. It wasn't even the size of a mustard seed, which is only a speck, like a speck of pepper. Smallest seed that he could think of. <laughs> Scripture says, and I saw between the throne. Oh, wait a minute. Question. From the seven spirits of God, which order of importance are they? In, in order of the candlestick? And then I quoted scripture and said, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, and which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. So the lamb that has the seven horns, the seven eyes, those are the spirits of God. That the Lamb of God is the possessor of the seven spirits in the same way that each of us has seven power centers comprised within our mortal bodies. That's a chapter in my book, The Mystery Explained. The Lamb of God is the light from Genesis 1-3 and John 1, 4-9, sent by God to incarnate into heaven of this earth, of this earth realm from heaven. God's word incarnate from God's infinite realm is heaven from the first verse of god's word sent into sent into the earth as the lamb of god who stands in the center of the throne in heaven of this realm the lamb of god then incarnated onto this little earth as jesus christ the son of god to save sinners and i realize this paragraph you're going to stop this and read it because it's very complicated I've been asked about that this right here from three different people in the same week So here are the three realms. And let me tr just try to go through it for you. This is the infinite realm. This is heaven and this is earth. The same diagram that starts my book with three little circles. It's actually more complicated than that. By the time you get to the end of my book, then you see in all of these different water witnesses, blood witnesses, spirit witnesses. God, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So the Word and God are the same thing in this infinite realm. God and His Word are right there right now. The Word has no need of being repaired, fixed, restored, raised from the dead, or anything. God asked His Word to incarnate as heaven of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. These are created realms, incarnations. This is an incarnation of heaven from above. This is the incarnation of the earth. John the Baptist walks around and says, I am of the earth. He is from heaven. He is above all. Heaven is the incarnation. Christ is the incarnation of this heaven right here. John the Baptist is the incarnation of this earth. God's teaching us something in the types of their relationships. So if you, John stands over here and he looks straight at the lamb right in the center of the throne. He looks straight through and he sees the face of the man. That's Christ raised from the dead at the right hand of God, sitting right here in the heavenly places that are in Christ Jesus. This diagram doesn't show that this is Christ Jesus. So that's exactly what heaven is of Genesis 1.1. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as a man. So John's looking straight through. He sees the Lamb and the four living creatures. It looks like they're standing around the Lamb because from his perspective, that's what it looks like. He's looking right into heaven and right into the infinite realm and seeing all three as one. So these living creatures, that's God to come, God who was, and God who is. God who is is the one speaking in Genesis 1.26, saying, Let us make man in our image. Spirit, blood, water. Heaven, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Spirit, blood, water. Earth, heavens, heaven, earth. Spirit, blood, water. John, spirit, blood, water. Your family, man, woman, spirit and water. The seed that enlarges, that expands in the middle, like all blood witnesses are the blood witnesses. To become either a spirit witness, like the angels, or a man, who's the image and glory of God, or as a helper, as the, the like the body serves the soul and the spirit, the Holy Spirit serves the Father and the Son. God who was serves, God who is, and God who was. 
I'm sorry, God who was serves God to come and God who is. I know it's a little, it seems like it's complicated. God is no simpleton. Many, many people think, well, it should be simpler than this. And it is simple. To me, I can see it. See these things by the Spirit. That's how the diagrams are drawn. It is simple. But it's tricky trying to explain things, even whenever you can see them. So um, the question being asked pertains to the seven um, spirits. So the Lamb's spirits, the Lamb's seven spirits are all equally important, just like your fingers. Which of them is most, most important? Well, it depends. If you're getting something out of your ear, that pinky is real important, isn't it? Thumb is, is useless. The seven rays of light, they're broken down the same way as the seven power centers in our body, the seven power centers in the sun, that are those seven spirits. And they're all important. Every, all those light rays together make the white light that comes into the left side of the prism in this diagram whenever you click on it. I'm trying to use analogies to help you see about the number seven and how it applies to humans. It's to, it applies to us and it applies to the Son of Man, to the Lamb of God the same way. That's what's being described in Revelation. Number three, are fallen angels rebels? Do they have a probation period? Are they ever forgiven? First important fact, realize that every host in the earth realm has an infinite realm God counterpart as a brother of Adam we're seventh day people or a member of his body the six day people the six day people have been here for hundreds of thousands and millions of years they are Chinese they are the, the eastern races they're all RH positive they all have RH positive blood 99 point something percent of all Chinese. The only reason there's even less than 1% is because of the Seventh-day people that intermingled with them. Same with the Aborigine peoples, American Indian peoples, the Indians, native Indians around the planet. They have been here a lot. They're all RH positive. They have black hair, straight hair, usually, unless they, and they have beardless, unless they have Seventh-day blood in them. And somebody like me, I'm a Seventh-day person with Sixth-day blood in me. I'm part Indian. So my beard doesn't come in all the way. That's the difference. And so seventh-day people are gods in God's infinite realm, just like Adam. Six-day people are incarnations here representing hosts inside of Adam on the day God made him. So when God made us in the infinite realm as gods, he made us with members inside of our body. When Satan murdered Adam, they died too. The sons of Adam that incarnated inside of him, that's what it means to go into, to know someone. In the Hebrew, which is carry over into the way things are in the infinite realm. So we all know when it, each, we all know each other. All seven days, we already know each other. We've all incarnated inside of each other. We have experiences together in the infinite realm. We're playing out things already done. Ecclesiastes 1, 9 through 11, right here. We're playing out things already done. Just a little minuscule part of it, we have to incarnate each age. Hundreds and hundreds of ages are still coming, and we're going to continue to play out things already done to reproduce what's happened in the infinite realm between infinite gods. That's what it's about. So this is the explanation here that, I'm, that I was sharing with you. So God is restoring Adam one member at a time through the birth, death, judgment process. Part of the restoration of all things prophesied by Christ about Elijah. No, there's no probation period of forgiveness of those thrown in the lake of fire with their father, the devil. It's intimated in the Greek idiom to the ages of the ages, which is translated forever and forever. But it's done in the Aorus tense, which in all your Bibles is translated in the past tense because the translators don't know what to do with it. It's the tense of perpetuity. There's three different cases, th three different ways it goes. It's, it's a, a deep study that you might want to get into. It's, it's something I did in my youth. Whether God has, pl has plans for the sons of disobedience is up to God. If he's going to have plans to redeem them, it's going to be in something other than what he shared in his word. Because it's just not there. On the, la uh, on the last supper, they ate fish and bread. 
Is that a reference to Jesus? There's a lot more on the menu at the Lord's Supper rather than just fish, which is usually fish sauce and bread. Remember the sons of Israel sacrificed the lamb on the evening of the Passover to then eat the lamb with bitter herbs as a reminder of their captivity, you know, their slavery. So Christ used the bread at the Last Supper to say, take, eat, this is my body. And the wine is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Or left out of Esther, Jesus Christ is the bread of life because he is God's word made flesh as the walking, talking Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in all into the one. So the, the, the spirit witness is the oil part. The Holy Spirit is the water part. And the broken bread in the middle, put them all together. The broken grain in the middle, that's where you get the bread from. That's why he proclaims, I and the Father are one. He can also say that of the Holy Spirit. So here we go. See, my Father who art in heaven, my Father who art in heaven. This is heaven of Genesis 1.1. That's where he gets his name. Many, many people believe that this is the Almighty, and it's not. I'm going through that with a couple of my friends right now, trying to help them to see it. Because they are praying, they, they're praying through the Son to my Father who art in heaven. Well, what about the Almighty? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are the three witnesses of the Word. The Word of John 1, 1 through 3 and 14. Right? This is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit walking, talking Jesus Christ as a man. The Word made flesh. He is our intercessor, Romans 8, 34. Our intercessor as members of Christ's body. He is something different to the Jews. You have to realize that he's the Messiah to the Jews. He's not the Messiah to us. We're members of his body. Completely different thing. Then Hebrews 1.8. Remember that God made the Son to be God. God the Almighty. The God that's speaking in Genesis 1.26. He rests on the seventh day. The Lamb of God picks up the work in Genesis 2, start at 4, and begins creating the seventh day man, which is Adam. The consecration work that he does on this seventh day, that's what he's doing. God made the Lord God, Christ, to be God over Israel. So he's the one that's dealing with Israel throughout the Old Testament. He's the one that gave him the Ten Commandments, the one that put Moses in the cleft of the rock, all that. So whenever Christ is teaching Israel how to pray, then they pray to my Father who art in heaven because God made him God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for Israel. But that's not the same relationship that we have with God through his Son, Christ Jesus. This heavenly Adam right here, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Spirit, Soul, Body, is Christ Jesus. Only Paul refers to Christ Jesus. And there's a difference between Jesus Christ and Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is... Ephesians 2, start at 4. We are raised with him, Jesus Christ, and seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is seated in Christ Jesus. This is Christ Jesus right here. Raised above all the heavens. Ephesians 4, 6 through 8, up to 10. Raised above all the heavens of this realm and seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus right here. That's where we are too, in this almost infinite realm sent here as ambassadors of Christ for God. Reconciling, that's how he's reconciling the world from within us. Okay, so the Almighty is Revelation 1.8 and it says God who is, God who was, and God who is to come. That's the same relationship as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but people don't see the Almighty they do not realize he has three witnesses of his own. They are into this. My they worshiping my Father who art in heaven. Okay, so this is a reference. The question I know I'm getting seems like I'm getting a little bit off here, but this is this is meat to help to see the larger picture, showing how Christ is the bread right here. Oil, water, the bread together. He has the same relationship with the Father and Holy Spirit as heaven was, has with the heavens and the earth. And that God who is has with his prophet and his priest 
Holy Spirit is in the priest position. My Father who art in heaven is in the prophet position. For the Son, the same way. So you can draw a circle around the, the Son and, the, and my Father who art in heaven. And you can draw a circle around my, the Son and the Holy Spirit. The same way that you can, if this is you, your spirit, your soul, your body, you can draw a circle around your spirit and your soul. And around your body and your soul. Same relationship. Your soul and your spirit are one. That's what Christ is saying. He can also say, my soul and my body are one. They share a circle, you see. And yet, what's in the middle, heaven, or your soul, separates the spirit from the body. See, they don't touch. It's an important thing to realize, too. It's all about relationships. All of the spirit witnesses have relationships with the blood witnesses and the water witnesses. God gives us part of the story with each so that seeing all of them, we can see the whole. Okay, so why after the flood were they were allowed to eat meat? And what does it mean that the life is in the blood? And I kind of shake my head when I get this question because the very first offering with Cain and Abel shows Abel and his part on his part also brought of firstlings of his flock. Now why does he even have a flock? In their fat portions. He knows the about the fat portions, that's the good stuff. And the firstlings, if there's a firstlings, there's a secondling, there's the thirds, right? The first is the best. And that's part of the sacrifice that Israel had to make. They couldn't take the scrawny little lamb. They had to get the best one, the unspotted one, the unblemished one, this and that. Those were the rules. Then, uh, as far as the blood, for the life of the flesh, this is just quoting Leviticus 17. For life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. So there's kind of a connection there between the firstlings and the sacrifice and the atonement. So when you take the blood, you cut the throat, you take the blood, that's what makes atonement. But this word atonement here is a covering rather than forgiveness like we have in the New Testament. There was no such thing as forgiveness of sins in the Old Testament. You cannot be, for, you cannot be made righteous by not doing something. Look at the Ten Commandments. You shall not do this, you shall not do this, you shall not do this. Nobody's ever been made righteous, and particularly to attain the righteousness of God by not doing something. It's amazing to me the number of professing Christians that bind themselves by Mosaic law as if they're a child of Israel without any consideration of who God's talking to. God told Noah to go build an ark. Does that mean you're supposed to go build an ark? No. If he gives the law to Israel, Paul says specifically that the Gentiles, Romans 2, are without the law. Ten Commandments were never given to Gentiles. Doesn't mean that you go out there and do the opposite of what they say. Or anything like that. Having the new man, obeying the gospel, having the new man in your heart changes everything. Because then we have heaven incarnate inside of us. That's another incarnation of heaven that I was um, trying to explain earlier. I realize it's pretty complicated. I've been standing in front of my friends and trying to explain it to them, and their heads start swimming. From understanding Christ in you is an incarnation, just like Jesus Christ walking around is an incarnation of the Lamb of God, just like the Lamb of God is an incarnation of heaven, and heaven is an incarnation of God's Word in the infinite realm. That's a whole bunch of incarnating going on right there. And the Word is everywhere. It's even incarnate as our written Word of God. The only living, breathing, active document in existence. Then uh, the Lord's Supper. What does the eating and drinking unworthy mean? Aren't we all unworthy? Many are confused by, Paul, by Paul's instructions to the Corinthians that contain elements and precepts of kingdom doctrine. For kingdom disciples who obeyed the gospel of the kingdom. Look at the beginning. Cleo's people. The, those that were of Apollos. 
of Paul, of Cephas. What is all of that? Those are people that obeyed the gospel of the kingdom. They were baptized for the forgiveness of sins by confessing their sins and being literally baptized in water according to the precepts of, the doc, the, the, of doctrine in the gospel of the kingdom. That does not apply to us. We're saved by the blood of Christ. Our sins are forgiven by his um, blood. Our redemption's in him. Our one baptism is into his body on the cross at Calvary. We become active participants in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's why we're dead already. God put our sin on Christ. We're done. Finished. Seated in the heavenly places with him in Christ Jesus. Complete. Peter, John, and James don't have that. Gospel of the kingdom. Forgive sins. Yes. Yeah, same forgiveness. Same Greek term. Mark 1, uh, 4. The forgiveness of sins. Forgiven. But it's by water. Remember, Christ came in water and in blood, not in water only, water and in blood. Three that testify, the spirit, water, and the blood, and the three are into the one. 1 John 5, start at 6. But his water ministry is the gospel of the kingdom, water baptism for the gifts of sins, water gospel. His blood ministry is the apostle Paul as the steward of the dispensation of God's grace. Completely different ministry. Completely different. When you mix them together, that's where you get in trouble. And some people mix them together because of interpretations of what Paul writes, particularly in 1 Corinthians chapters what, 11 through about 14. Because he's writing to kingdom disciples. That's a veil, invisible veil within the Pauline epistles is put there deliberately by God to test us, the sons of God. Are we going to see it? Are we going to make allowances for it? Or are we going to trip over it, over it? The mature members of Christ's body, we see it and we pass right through with, with uh, flying colors. So, some were taking animals sacrificed to the goddesses and incorporating those things into the Passover rituals that are for Israel and king disciples only. Paul writes to us, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food, drink, in respect to festival or new moon or Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. We are members of Christ's body. These things belong to us. Israel of the flesh and kingdom disciples are under law till heaven and earth pass away. That's why James, James 2.10, if you stumble at one point, you're guilty of all. If you're a kingdom disciple, look at the first verse he's writing to Israel dispersed abroad. He's writing to kingdom disciples, people like Peter, John, and James, like the disciples. That's not us. Making the separation is greatly important. That's really probably primary in my ministry is helping people see the difference so they do not mix the water and the blood together um, who is uh, and I could have omitted these but to give you an idea is the person uh, to who, who Jesus is right and John together you're looking at a picture it's likely Roman Catholic it's likely you know something like that you have to give me a reference but still we're looking at a picture you really need to send me a scriptural reference because I know the Bible really, really well, but different church doctrine from thousands of denominations. Just imagine if you spent all your time knowing that, you wouldn't have time to be in God's Word. Don't be able to understand it. Okay, when the top part is crucified, is the next crown representation of the person of the king on earth. Not sure how that works. Other than it seems to me sacrificing self which I thought represented ego. However, I want to honor God. And I had difficulty in understanding what what you were writing about right there. If you give me a scriptural verse, it gives me a good clue. Then I then that gives me some context for what you're talking about. But generally, when you just looking at the keywords, when you're talking about ego, you're talking about self, then these are issues, these are personal issues that you're dealing with within yourself. And sometimes we have conflict in ourselves and we place faces on them that are in our environment, which could be me, could be God, could be somebody else that's in your environment. But that those are little triggers for me in um, trying to and when I'm trying to help somebody to see where they're coming from when, when there's a lack of context. Is angel song in the Bible? How does it sing? If you hear the song, 
does that mean you discovered yourself? And which would be ego? To hear the ego and the self is a recurrent theme. And after the dragon's head falls, what is after that? What head does the dragon represent in the Last Supper in the Bible? And see, there are connections here that do not need to be connected. When you're talking about the dragon's head, you're talking about the battle in Revelation between Michael the Archangel and the dragon. The, and that battle is going on this instant. It's happening right now, the same way it was 2,000 years ago, the same way it was back in gen the days of Genesis. It's just, it's happening in an almost infinite realm. So those that are claiming that they're interacting and communicating with Michael the Archangel, absolutely impossible. That's an almost infinite host. He is frozen motionless, fighting the dragon. He's cut off his head. The head hasn't hit the ground yet. The tail is sweeping across the sky in this almost infinite realm. And those stars are falling down into this earth realm, occupying the heavenly places, the evil heavenly places above, Ephesians 12, Ephesians 6, 12. And as human beings on the earth, the Hillary's, the House of Rothschild, Council on Foreign Relations, all these guys that have plans to kill the useless eaters, that's us, they are trying to victimize us the same way they victimized us during the Satanic Rebellion. They're doing things. They cannot control it. They have no power in their hand whatsoever. Any power they have comes from far, far, far beyond. It's all fixed, and they cannot change it. They cannot change it to be good guys. They're already burning in the lake of fire. They just don't know it yet. When there's a rapture, there's a rapture of the righteous, according to the mystery of Christ, and a rapture of the unrighteous, according to the mystery of iniquity. They're already in the lake of fire, burning right now, just like we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. Same thing. This is opposite sides of the same coin. Mystery of Christ on one side, mystery of iniquity on the other side. Okay. So, the, uh, the, the, uh, the angel song that she's talking about is in my book. And this is the way that I'm characterizing it. This is the way from my walk and my experience. And reading and feeding upon God's word in the knowledge of his three witnesses, testifying from Genesis to Revelation, everywhere in between, allows the songs to emerge from the center of the souls where Christ is incarnate in us. I probably should have got the, got up the, the I should have read the first sentence. God gave the law, like the Holy Scriptures, having been ordained by the angels as part of the process. Then note the, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb being sung in Revelation 15, where the Lamb is in the center of the throne. So you have those on the sea of glass out in front of us. That's Peter and his people. They're singing the song of Moses. They're members of Moses' body, 1 Corinthians 10. They're all baptized into the sea, into the Moses, into the cloud, blah, 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 blah. They're water witnesses. They're priests. They're a kingdom of priests. We judge the world and the angels. We're kings, rulers, judges, blood witnesses. They're water witnesses. We're in the Lamb. They're standing out in front of us. But the thing is, they're singing... Their song, the song of Moses, we're singing the song of the Lamb. The song of the Lamb is our combined testimony of what God is showing us about his Son of God in whom all knowledge and wisdom is concealed. It's hidden, but we can see it. But we're looking inside that jewel, different facets. I see part, you see part, we all see part. We all have to testify as we're all testifying together, like the witnesses in God's word are all testifying simultaneously. When you know the stories and you know who's a wit spirit witness, who's a water witness, who's a blood witness, you, you, you understand that, then you begin, like me, hearing all their voices at the same time. And as, they, as it's testifying, it's testifying and mo it's moving you. You can feel it in the, in, in the center of your soul. It's coming out like a tree of life. It's bubbling. It's, it's alive. And it, to me, reminds me of angel song. You can call it the lamp, the, the, the singing of the lamb. You call it whatever you want. But we have heaven incarnate in us. In the center of that throne is where it comes from. We're all around it. We're all looking into that jewel. And the singing is coming as if it's light coming from that jewel as we're looking in. And, ex and sharing the experiences that we all see together by looking into the facet that God has given us to look into. I have one. You have one. We all have to testify. That's why this takes a while. This is only the beginning, where, where, where we are right now. Okay, does the tent door represent the worldview? If not, what does it represent? This is, you need to, the, there are six references to the tent door. If you, meant, if you mean the tent of meeting, you mean 
are you making reference to the the first veil of the tabernacle of moses this is what it could be but if you whenever you send me the questions please send a script, scriptural reference so then i can go look up sometimes you're using you are you have a translation that's different from mine and so what's what's keyworded into my mind is from the new american standard and you're doing it from a different version and i can't make the connection unless you give unless you give me a little more information so what i could share is there's six references to the to uh, the door into the tent the first veil in the tabernacle currently represents the veil between earth and heaven that is why the labor of water is on the outside with the brazen altar requiring baptism the priests go through this ritual they have to baptize first then they have to do things with the oil that's the spirit witness before they can go into the final it's preparation for passing in through the second veil whenever they use the oil and they're moving into the blood witness center part between the two veils that's in the holy place and in the last days there was eating and drinking and marrying given in marriage is that a reference to the last supper and i see also this fixation on the, the lord's supper it's the passover supper christ did it every year of his life just like all those jews they all did it the 14th day of nisan at the passover because they were bound by law to do it and they have the ritual that they carry out with the drinking of the three glasses of wine the last glass is left in the center of the table when they all leave just be prior to that when they're all still sitting there the youngest at the table is sent to open the door to see if elijah's there that they have certain things that they do according to the law and certain things they do according to tradition certain things that they can eat certain things they are not allowed they're, they have to clean the leaven out of their houses not just not in the food out of their houses as a lead up to doing all these things but they're under mosaic law you're not under mosaic law unless you want to place yourself under mosaic law which why would you want to do that there's there are hundreds of laws if you're going to obey some of them you need to obey all of them there's no gentile prepared on earth to be able to do that in my opinion they try 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 all they want but there's there's going to be you're going to have issues when you try to keep every aspect of a mosaic law one for every day of the year one for every bone in your body and whenever we're under grace and not under law romans 6 14 why do you want to do that but the what did christ die for even those under the law he removed from the law he made them free he placed them under grace even those like paul who was a pharisee he could eat all things he could do whatever he wanted to do he was no longer bound under law that doesn't mean you want to go out there and rob banks or anything like that if, if you're for those that are wondering if i'm trying to push the envelope not at all we do the things naturally that we're supposed to do when we have christ incarnate inside of us thinking about the other person first then is everything we see a reflection of our views of or self and is this our house thank you so much you are asking for my opinion there is no single rule with application to everyone living vastly different lives and thinking thoughts using a wide spectrum of varying belief systems values and ideas in general for me a person's self-image plays a role in the way they interact with their environment and with others those seeing themselves working in the spirit of helping others will see and react with the world and others differently than one working each day to feed himself his own needs and the old nature that is the lesson of the long spoons allegory you know where in the first example everybody's got long spoons and they're skinny they're scrawny they're crying they're wailing that's hell and then on the other side everybody's got long spoons glued to their hands but they're feeding each other that's kind of the lesson of uh the way that we view ourselves so our self-image is extremely important and when how we view ourselves cha can change things in our environment it affects our goals it affects our way of life and when we view ourselves as helping and serving the needs of someone else then we are a vastly different person than one who is out there just trying to feed himself putting himself first above everybody else that's what gets them in trouble and they wind up scrawny skinny spiritually with a long spoon never able to feed themselves going hungry rather than just flipping the switch and changing the attitude and feeding everybody around them and then being fed in exchange so that's um the 
this newsletter is going to be a question and answer generally from someone just like Linda here. And we're going to go through it. And uh, not very much more to get your coronavirus and all that information. Go to the Black Star um, newsletter. Appreciate your support very, very much. And I'm going to do my best to make one of these type videos each week. Uh, moving forward, I'm going to do my very best. Unless it's just impossible, then that's my goal moving forward. Appreciate your support very, very much. Get more information right here over here at the website. And I'll see you on the next um, Mr. Report.